Good afternoon. This is Jim Ellsbury, Associate Pastor at Beacon of Hope Ministries in Clearwater, Florida. I'm coming to you today with the 13th installment of my End Time Prophecy series based on the book of Revelation. Today we're going to be covering a lot of territory and it's kind of going to be left off at a cliffhanger just to give you forewarning. You, just a reminder, you can see the, these posts and all of Beacon of Hope Sunday sermons going back to the beginning of 2021, plus our Wednesday night Bible studies on our YouTube channel. You just go to YouTube, type in capital B, capital O, capital H, capital M, space global, and you have, uh, you know, you can view all of those. So I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you to subscribe because it doesn't cost you anything, but you'll be notified whenever um, a new post has been made. And I just want to say here, we appreciate Madeline, who is our kind of our YouTube guru, who does all the posting for us. So today I want to start with Revelation chapter 14. Last week we left off with, we talked about the Antichrist and the false prophet. Um, now the scene shifts. And I, and I noticed when I was reading this, it's almost as though we needed a reprieve of some sort. You know, that uh, chapter 13 was kind of a nasty little chapter. And chapter 14 starts on a very positive note. So Revelation chapter 14, starting with verse 1, Then I looked, and behold... The Lamb, Jesus, was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Now, we talked about the 144,000 way back in chapter 7, okay? Um, chapter 7, chapter 8. The 144,000 are symbolic of the church. Okay, the believing remnant. And verse 2 says, And I heard a voice from heaven, the sound of many waters, loud thunder, and the 144,000 had harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed, purchased from the earth. Okay, so this is a song especially for the church. This is a song for the for Jesus' bride. Verse 4 and 5 are really important. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Now, a couple of things here. As far as the first fruits, uh, James talks about that in James chapter 1. Okay, so let's turn over there briefly. Um James chapter 1, uh, starting in, well, we'll just do verse 18. James 1, 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. We who believe are the first fruits, okay? And if you go back, this is, this is really kind of cool, and since we're coming up on the resurrection, in the Jewish cycle of annual feasts, you know, it starts with Passover, then unleavened bread, Passover symbolic of Jesus dying on the cross, unleavened bread, the fact that he took our sins and our sin nature, and then first fruits, which was on the Sabbath after the Passover. So, this is when you offered the early spring grains to God. Okay, so Jesus fulfilled that. He was the first fruits. But then what happened? The next feast is Pentecost, 
when the church was born, 50 days after the resurrection. The Holy Spirit was poured out. The church was born. And another name for Pentecost, it's called the Feast of Weeks, but it's like second first fruits. So you've got Jesus, the first fruits, and us. We are also the first fruits, the fruit of the day of Pentecost. Also, it says he purchased men. Now, I looked up that Greek word. I just want to make sure that I had everything together here. And that Greek word is anthropos, which means men, mankind, not male. That's a completely separate word. That's arsen. But anthropos is generic human. So the 144,000 is not just men. It's the redeemed. And remember, that number is symbolic of all the believing, all the ones who believed in Jesus. And then we have three angels who come flying through the air. The first proclaims the eternal gospel. The second comes through and proclaims that Babylon is fallen. And we're going to talk about Mystery Babylon next week. The third comes through with a horrifying warning, saying that anyone who worships the beast or has the mark of the beast or the number of his name will be cast into the lake of fire. And we will see later, that's the second death. That's what we want to avoid at all costs. I'm not sure, again, what these angels are. Some have theorized that it's Christian broadcasting going out on satellites, you know, going out through satellite television. I don't know. It very easily could be. It could just as easily be three angels flying in midheaven around the world proclaiming this message. By this, by the, by the time we get toward the end of the tribulation, people are going to be used to seeing things and it would by, be, by no means be unusual for this to have happened. Now, in starting in Revelation 14, 14, we have a white cloud and one sitting on it who looks like, in my translation, New American Standard, has a son of man. It is also translated the son of man. So here's this white cloud and one sitting on it who looks like the Son of Man. That is another title for the Messiah, for Jesus. So here's Jesus sitting on this cloud. It says he has a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Well, that can't be good. Another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. In Jesus' parables about the kingdom, he often talked about this, that at the end of the age, the reaping would come. Remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? You know, the, the servant came to the master and said, somebody sowed these weeds among the wheat. And the master said, just wait till they grow up. We'll separate them at the end. That's what this is referring to. The separation of the wicked from the righteous. Okay? Jesus said, you know, at the end, the angels are going to come and harvest us, basically. Take us, keep us safe, take us out, and get us ready for the kingdom. And then in verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one with the power over fire, came out from the altar, and he cried out with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because the grapes are right, ripe. So the angel swung his sickle and gathered the vines, gathered the grapes, the clusters, and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, 
and blood came up from the wine press up to the horse's bridle for a distance of 200 miles. Okay, I want to give you my thoughts on this. You see the difference here. We're not told what the one sitting on the cloud reaped. It just said, it just says in verse 16, he swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. That could be a veiled reference to the second coming of Jesus, where we are taken up before the final wrath of God occurs. That's very possible. But again, it also refers to the separation that Jesus promised would happen at the end of the age. Again, possibly a veiled reference to the rapture of the church at the end of the tribulation. Now, this second angel, however, this is different. The angel cuts down the grapes, puts them in a wine press, and treads out the wrath of God. Now, it's been theorized that there's not enough blood in all the humans alive to cover five foot tall, which would be about the height of the bridle, for 200 miles. So, this may be symbolic. It's very possible, because, you know, it's just a whole lot of blood, and I'm not sure where that's going to come from. So I tend to lean that this is possibly very symbolic, although it could happen at the seventh seal when Jesus comes back, or at the seventh vial, I'm sorry, when Jesus comes back. It's very possible because there will be massive, massive bloodshed at that point. So this could be a fourth telling, a foretelling of that. Then for chapter 15, a scene in heaven. And then John sees another sign in heaven. Marvelous, great and marvelous. Seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last, because with them the wrath of God is finished. Remember I said when we talked about the trumpets, these are, those were partial judgments. Well, with the seven vials or the seven bowls, That'll be it. That is God's final judgment on earth. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. I'm going to stop right there. This, remember the song in in, or the singing in verse, in chapter 14, was for all the saved. Okay, for the bride of Christ. This one is for the martyrs. This song in chapter 15 is for the martyrs. The ones who have come off victorious from the beast. The ones who overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and by not loving their lives even to the point of death. These are the ones. These are the martyrs. Oh, and I just want to make a point back in chapter 14, verse 4 and 5. Remember in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said, husbands love your wives like, like Jesus does the church. And he gave himself up to present himself a bride, holy and pure. And it says, you know, in verse 4 of chapter 14, and I am so sorry to backtrack, but this is an important point, that they were virgins. They did not defile themselves with women. And as we're going to find out next week, these would be the daughters of the harlot of Babylon, the whore of Babylon. Remember in early on when we talked about the seven churches, there was Thyatira who allowed the prophetess Jezebel to give her words of prophecy and she led the people astray. Well, these are people who have not been misled by false religion. They've stood firm in the face of false religion. And they follow the Lamb wherever it goes. Another possible translation there is they attend as servants. Okay, they attend as servants. So we get to do that as the church. Now back to chapter 15. 
In verse 3, it says, They sang the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts or your judgments have been revealed. Now, if you've been in church for many years, you may know there's a song for this. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and on and on. I won't sing the whole thing. But again, I love the way in Revelation that songs are put in here. Here we are at the very brink of the second coming of Jesus. And the martyrs are singing a song about how wonderful God is. They're not looking back at what they had to suffer. They're just before God singing, singing their praises. And that's very likely something we need to be learning how to do now. Because times are not going to get any easier. They're not. We may have a little lull in this particular birth pang that we're going through. But you can bet scripturally that another one's going to be rolling along. And who knows? This, These are the days to prepare. These are the days to make ready for whatever happens. Okay? So, after these things, chapter 15, verse 5. I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. That's significant. Okay, it's like whatever partition, curtain, doors there were, it, it's open. The holy of holies in heaven is laid bare. And seven angel, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Okay. So, and then in verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke, from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the sanctuary or the temple until the plagues of the seven angels were finished. If you remember in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon had built the temple, put everything in place, and the last piece of furniture to go in was the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle. Once that went in, the glory of God filled the temple, and Scripture says that the priests could not even stand up to minister. That's how powerful it was. And right here we see the, just the, the glory of God filling the heavenly temple, and no one could enter it. No one could enter it because of the judgments of God. The time has come. The judgments are being poured out. This is it, the finale. This is this is it. And no one at this point, until those plagues, there's this, however long or short this period is, from that, no one can enter into the temple. And that's scary because it's very possible that means that while the bowls are being poured out, no one can be saved. And I find that just frightening. So chapter 16, I do want to go through. And then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying, this is chapter 16, verse 1 of Revelation, saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went, poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Again, 
This is limited only to the people who have surrendered to the Antichrist. Some sort of malignant, loathsome, smelly, pukey, pussy sore breaks out. And if you've read as many end time novels as I have, you know, most people look at it as actually the mark becoming cancerous or something. So, but anyway, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. One of the trumpet judgments, you'll remember, was one third of the sea. And what we have with the bowls is the completion of those partial judgments. In verse 4 of chapter 16, the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Remember, the earlier judgment was a third of them became wormwood. Now all of them become blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. For, you, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Now, one thing I want to point out here, and I, and I never saw this before. In verse 5, the angel of the water says, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One. Remember at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, the Lord is described as the one who was, who is, and who is to come. We talked about this when we talked about the seventh trumpet. Who was and who is? Because he's come. And here's another point to that. Here's another thing that shows that before the vials, the bowls are poured out, Jesus has come back. He's taken us out. So we're not going to be here for the, for the seven bowls. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with the fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent as to give him glory. How like fallen human nature. To blame God, and not seeing this as God's judgment, not repenting, not, not repenting, and giving God the glory for this. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast and his kingdom. And his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. I can't imagine the degree of darkness where people would actually gnaw their tongues because the darkness was so deep that it caused them pain. And yet over the beast's kingdom... And, and this is not just like an electrical blackout. This is a supernatural, painful darkness. Uh, I'm reminded of an old Twilight Zone episode, which had to, which dealt with hate. In this small town, they were going to uh, hang a man. And even though he was guilty, and he admitted his guilt, the people hated him. Well, the sun never rose that day. It remained dark. And also... At, by the end of that Twilight Zone episode, they said there was a darkness over the wall in Berlin. That was obviously still when the Berlin Wall still stood. Darkness in Vietnam. Darkness on the south side of Chicago because of the hatred. The world was going dark. And, you know, who knows? Maybe Rod Serling read this and said, you know what? It's mankind's hatred that's going to cause this. At any rate, it was so deep, so dark, they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and again they blasphemed God, in verse 11, and did not repent of their sins. In verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates. Remember I said the Euphrates was kind of always the uh, symbolic boundary between east and west. And the water dried up, that the way should be prepared for the kings of the east, which, if you'll remember, that goes back to the sixth trumpet 
the army from the east. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in verse in chapter 16, verse 13, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and the mouth of the beast and the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. <coughs> so, there, these demons are going out and gathering all the armies of the world. And then there's the parentheses. You know, I like it that God puts these in there. Again, we're coming up to the very end. <coughs> and here, parentheses, behold, I, Jesus, am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Okay, so Jesus says, look, from here on out, everybody's blessed that dies in me. Verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Magedon. And that just simply means the Mount of Megiddo. And Megiddo was found near, in northern Israel, near the, uh, near to the Mediterranean Sea. So north of Jerusalem, all these armies are going to be gathered. All the armies of the world. In verse 17, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. <coughs> And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. It is done. Just like Jesus said from the cross, It is finished. It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There was a great earthquake such as not been since men came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away. The mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. And men, again, blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, because its plague was extremely severe. This is it. This is the last plague to be poured out before Jesus touches down in Jerusalem. Okay? The great city could be Rome. In John's day, Rome was considered the great city. And it's possible that the beast may make his headquarters there. It could possibly be Jerusalem. And it was split into three parts. Huge hailstones. Um, I'm originally from Indiana. I'm familiar with hailstones. Living in Florida now, we're still familiar with hailstones, but I can't imagine them weighing 75 to 100 pounds. I mean, that is something supernatural. And that the destruction, again, like the hailstorms in Egypt, would be almost complete. The cities fall, and Babylon the Great falls. Babylon, and we're going to, I'm going to talk about Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, next week. I'm going to talk about her and her end and the end of the world economic system. That's be Revelation chapter 17 and 18. But it's proclaimed, it's all gone, it's fallen, finally. Babylon is gone. And once we get through chapters 17 and 18, we're going to find out what happens to the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. How, what will happen to them? Because at this point in the tribulation, the seventh bowl has been poured out. Jesus has already raptured us. We've been taken up to meet him in the air. We're descending. I believe we are descending during the whole time that these bowls are being poured out. We're descending with Jesus as the judgments are poured out. Once that's over with, 
he will set foot in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives will split wide open when he does that. But that's yet to come. And I'm excited. I can't wait to get there. So I want to thank everybody for watching today. And remember, you can see this post, all my, all this whole series on the end times, along with Beacon of Hope's Sunday sermons going all the way back to the beginning of 2021 and our Wednesday night Bible studies on our YouTube channel. I do want to say this. If you have any questions, you can email me directly at Pastor Jim one that's p o p a s t o r jim one nine five five at gmail dot com. Um, I have been corresponding with uh, with with some, well with one person right now who's you know questioning, and that's great. I love it. I love to answer questions. So feel free to do that. Also, if you're in the Clearwater area, Clearwater, Florida, please join us Sundays ten a.m. You can also join us on Zoom. We Zoom all of our meetings. Um, you can just contact, well, you can contact me at pastorjim1955 at gmail.com and ask to be put on our Zoom list and I will send you the meeting, you know, the meeting name or, the, you know, meeting password and the actual password. So I appreciate you listening. And I just ask God to richly bless you. Amen.